Yeah, so the idea is to take the standard model of particle physics uh, seriously, and then to also take the cosmological solutions of Einstein's equations and their analytic extensions, their maximal analytic extensions, both along the real time direction and uh, in, the, in the complex time plane seriously. And if those have extra symmetries or structure, uh, uh, meromorphic properties, we want to take those seriously as hints about the universe and rather than as rather than regarding them as mathematical artifacts. And the sort of surprising and exciting thing has been that that those two simple ingredients, um, you know, lead to very interesting new ways of looking at a lot of things about cosmology. Okay, so let me let me dive in. So, um, oops. So, um, yeah, so here's here's my cartoon picture of the expanding universe. So this is time is moving up the slide here. So this is actually the conformal time, uh, which cosmologists like to use. And then this is the sort of inverted lampshade here is supposed to be the universe uh, expanding as the as uh, uh, as time evolves. And so we today live somewhere up here at the long after the bang. And we look back, you know, with with our observations toward the Big Bang. And of course, we can't see all the way back. Uh, but you know, we can see very close. And, uh, you know, to make a long story short, the what we what we've learned from looking back as far as we can toward the Big Bang is that there's this uh, basic pattern that the further back you look, that the simpler things get. And so already, you know, a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, the universe was in this ultra simple state compared to how it is today. So, in, so I've tried to summarize some of the ways that it's uh, very simple over here. So, so, so first of all, to a first approximation, the geometry is just a maximal, you know, at a, at a, if you snapshot at a given high crest, at a given moment in time, is a maximally symmetric three geometry. It's basically just Euclidean space to almost perfectly Euclidean space, hi Dick. Um, and, uh, but with tiny, very tiny, uh, ten, uh, of order one part in 100,000 uh, perturbations in the density from one point to another and temperature from one point to another. But then even those tiny density perturbations have turned out to be as simple as can be. They, they seem to be perfectly uh, scalar perturbations, or in other words, density perturbations with uh, no, no observable tensor or vector perturbations so far. Uh, they seem to be also, uh, in a statistical sense, maximally symmetric. They share the complete symmetry of the background geometry. And uh, moreover, they seem to be perfectly Gaussian. So far, no sign of non-Gaussianity. They seem to be perfectly adiabatic. So far, no sign of non-adiabaticity. Uh, so their statistics is described simply by their two-point function completely, as far as we can tell. And, and that seems to be a perfect power law, as far as we can tell. And moreover, to within a couple of percent, it's an it's a almost perfectly scale invariant power law. Um, and uh, uh, and moreover, uh, the, the, the perturbations are sort of temporarily synch synchronized in the sense that if you look at perturbations at different wavelengths, say, hi, long time, uh, that they, 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 they seem to have all, you know, gone, it, it's as if, it, it's, it's as if, if the universe was really radiation dominated all the way back to the bang, it's as if all the perturbations satisfied a Neumann boundary condition. So they all sort of stopped, you know, we're at, we're at a peak of their oscillation right at the Big Bang, started in sync in that sense. And then the only reason they got out of sync later is because different modes of different wavelengths oscillate at different um, frequencies. And so they, 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 there appear to be Neumann boundary conditions for the scalar perturbations at the Big Bang. So there are all these simple properties and uh, these are somehow the, clearly the key clue about the early universe, this fundamental clue uh, about what happened in the early universe. And the question is, what are they trying to tell us? Um, you know, so the, the traditional interpretation, uh, the conventional interpretation is that, okay, so as we, look, as we look further and further back toward the Big Bang, it looks like the universe, you know, all observations as far back as we can see, seem to indicate that the uh, universe is getting simpler and simpler. But the conventional in interpretation is that if we could look back even further, it would get messy again. So there was the, the idea is there was some initial mess uh, uh, with, 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 with none of these properties. And then the, somehow the, the goal of an early universe theory is to sort of insert a period 
uh, here, which might be inflation or in other models is something else to sort of clean up the mess, to take the messy initial state and turn it into the simple thing we actually see. Um, and so I just want to, in this talk, explore a different possibility, which is to sort of just try to take the observations at face value. They, 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 they seem to be indicating that all the way back to a fraction of a second after the bang, that the further back you look, uh, the, the simpler things get in this sense, um, in this sense here. And I just want to imagine what maybe that is really what the universe is trying to tell us. Maybe that for, for whatever reason is how things work as you approach the Big Bang and try to follow that line of thought and see where that leads us. Okay, so as a first step in doing that, it's very helpful to use this trick that Roger Penrose introduced in the 60s famously uh, of Penrose diagrams. So we, we're, gonna, we're gonna imagine conformally rescaling the space time. So, so sort of stretching it in a way that locally preserves angles and small shapes um, uh, in such a way as to make the sort of boundaries and singularities make their causal structure you know, easier to see and more manifest. Um, so I've just taken that previous sort of inverted lampshade and stretched it out into this um, uh, straight cylinder. But anyway, it's just a matter of draw, how to draw it. Nothing, nothing has physically changed about the space time, but okay, so fine. So again, now we're assuming that this early universe really is as simple as it seems to be. It's really this ultra simple radiation dominated early phase. Um, and so if so, well, then we know what the metric was like very near the Big Bang. It was, it was just this, to a very good approximation, it was just the flat Minkowski metric times an overall conformal factor, the square of the um, scale factor. And moreover, we know what the scale factor was doing. It was doing something very simple. It was just proportional to the conformal time. And so if we follow it back a little bit beyond this fraction of a second after the bang, we hit this singularity when tau equals zero because the, the conformal factor hits zero at that point, but it's a very special type of singularity, very different than an ordinary singularity in GR. And an ordinary singularity, you know, you, you, you get to it and you can't analytically extend the solution past it. Um, but, the, but, but the Big Bang in our past, as long emphasized by Penrose, has this very different special character that um, all that's happening is that momentarily, at a, at a, at a, at a fixed point in time, uh, the... Uh, conformal factor is passing through zero, but the metric is otherwise completely regular. Um, and moreover, it's passing through zero in this perfectly analytic fa fashion. It's just a simple zero of the conformal factor. Um, uh, and so there's no ambiguity in this case about how to analytically extend. We just let the time, instead of cutting off tau when tau hits zero, we just let it extend to minus negative values as well. And when we do that, we get this extended cylinder that now, now this is the surface tau equals zero here where the scale factor um, passes through zero. Um, but then we get this sort of two sheeted model where um, extended space time where A is positive up here and negative down here. And the first thing you notice about this extended space time is that it has a new symmetry that, it, that you didn't notice before. That the, There's a new isometry of the geometry, namely this time reversal isometry where you swap the top and bottom of the cylinder like flipping over an hourglass and the space time is invariant under that. And the reason that that is interesting, one of the reasons that's interesting, we'll see there's a several different, if you take that hint seriously, there's several different things that are interesting about it. But one of them is that you may know that on a curved space time background, uh, in general, there's not a canonical or best vacuum state. So, you know, we're used to the fact that in special relativity in flat space, there is a, a preferred vacuum state. There's a unique vacuum state for a quantum field theory like the standard model where that all that, that, that respects all of the symmetries of, of the Minkowski space we seem to live in on small scales. And so all inertial observers in Minkowski space agree on what the quote unquote zero particle state is. Um, but in curved space, that's not true. And so in, in, in a general curved space, uh, 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 and so in general, you know, different observers sitting, for example, at different places in the space time or in different states of motion might disagree about what the um, zero particle state is. And in particular, in an FRW space time, that is the case. Different observers, for example, at different times will usually disagree about what the vacuum state is. So there's in general, not a preferred state, but 
FRW almost has enough symmetry to have a preferred vacuum state. And it turns out that with this extra time reversal symmetry, uh, it does have enough symmetry. So there's a preferred vacuum state for quantum fields living on this full extended FRW space time. Um, and so we want to consider the hypothesis that uh, maybe, maybe the universe really is in that vacuum state. CPT, which is this thought to be this very fundamental and exact symmetry of the laws of nature, where you simultaneously swap particles and antiparticles, that's C, and then you reflect everything in a mirror, that's P, and then you also reverse the arrow of time, that's T. If you do those three operations together, that's a symmetry of any local Lorentz invariant quantum field theory, including the standard model. Um, but normally it looks like the symmetry is broken spontaneously by the actual state of our universe, which if you just look at the top half of the cylinder, doesn't seem to have a time reverse symmetry. But the idea is that, well, when you look at the full extended thing, um, it actually, maybe it does have the symmetry after all, maybe it's not broken. Um, and so we wanna consider this hypothesis that the sort of is suggested by that uh, analytic extension that the universe does not spontaneously violate CPT and see where that leads. Okay, and so here I just give a little bit more of an explanation about the story I was saying before about there being a preferred vacuum state. So you now when you when you when you when you quantize a field living on some uh, space-time background, you know one of the ways to do it. So here's for example a spinner field, a, a Dirac field. Uh, uh, you know, you, you expand it in a basis of solutions of the equations of motion. So here I'm expanding it in a basis of solutions of the Dirac equation, um, but I split them into the positive frequency solutions, the solutions that spin this way in the complex plane at, as a function of time, and the negative frequency solutions, the ones that spin the opposite way. And then to quantize, I promote the coefficients of these, of the positive frequency solutions to the annihilation operators of the particle of that field and the coefficients of the negative frequency solutions become the creation operators for the antiparticle of that field. But the problem in this language is that, you know, in curved space, in, in flat space, everybody agrees about what the positive and negative frequency solutions of the wave equation are, but in curved space, that's not true. And so, you know, for example, we up here, you know, in the CETA seminar room at late times long after the bang, we would split up the solutions of the Dirac equation in one way. And so we would we, we would make the splitting into positive and negative frequency. We would split the basis in this way, uh, in, in, in one way. And so we would define our annihilation and creation operators, uh, A and B, uh, in one way. Uh, we, we, are, we would use these, what we would call our positive frequency solutions, uh, psi plus here. And uh, so our vacuum state, the zero particle state we would define in the room here would be the state that is annihilated by all of our creation and annihilation operators. Um, but another hypothetical observer living, you know, long before uh, on the, at the other end of the cylinder here, they turn out would it turns out they would split their solutions up in a different way. Their, their positive frequency solutions would be these solutions psi minus. So they would have different uh, A's and B's which would annihilate a different state, which would be the vacuum according to them. Okay, but in this language, what I'm saying is that there, there is another way to split up the solutions on this extent, because the space-time has this symmetry under tau goes to minus tau, there's another way to split up the solutions where the positive frequency solutions obey this additional condition that the time, that, 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 that a given solution is equal to the charge conjugate solution at the opposite, at the negative, value of the time. And that, and then the coefficients in that expansion, the vacuum that they define, has this extra symmetry, this the CPT symmetry. Okay, so uh, I want to now uh, take that kind of abstract issue and now try to see what it what it what it implies when you try to apply it to the standard model of particle physics. So here I'm just briefly reviewing what are the particles in the standard model of particle physics. So the first line here are the bosons. We have the gauge boson for the strong force, the gluons, we have the gauge boson for the SU2 weak gauge symmetry, the W bosons, the, the, uh, the hypercharge gauge boson, and the Higgs doublet. And then down here are the fermions. Uh, so here we have three different colors of quarks. And then the corresponding leptons are the bottom row. Um, 
And uh, you know, before the discovery of neutrino oscillations, uh, we would have just included these 15 fermions. Uh, there would have been, in particular, everybody would have had a left-handed, you know, for example, there's D left and its partner D right, there's U left and its partner U right, there's E left and its partner E right for the left and right electron. But new left uh, would have not had a right-handed partner in the traditional minimal standard model. Um, but uh, ever since the discovery of neutrino oscillations in 1998, or in any case, the confirmation of neutrino oscillations in 1998, you know, the, the simplest renormalizable explanation for that has been that uh, the standard model uh, each generation includes also a right-handed neutrino. That also completes a number of sort of apparent patterns in the standard model, and it also uh, expl you know, explains a number of cosmological things that would not have would not have explanations just within the minimal standard model. So, but 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 this this it's important to emphasize this particle. These right-handed neutrinos have not been directly detected yet, so we don't know they're there. It seems more likely than not that they are there. And so people nowadays, when they refer to the so-called standard model, sometimes are referring to those being present, sometimes not. But in any case, uh, what what I want to say here is that if we don't include the right-handed neutrinos, there is just no dark matter candidate left in this. Theory. There's just no particles left here that are both stable and haven't been directly detected yet. Um, now, if you do include the right-handed neutrino, which we will assume henceforth forth is there, then, okay, we've, there's three of them because we add one in each generation. And it turns out that exactly one of those, there's exactly one dark matter candidate now in that model. One of those three right-handed neutrinos you know, can still be perfectly stable. And if it's perfectly stable, it turns out that because of the structure of the standard model, it also follows that it's perfectly dark. It's completely decoupled from everything except gravity. So that sounds great, You know, that somehow that sounds perfect for dark matter, that perfect, stabi perfect stability then implies perfect darkness. Um, so it looks like the last good dark matter candidate in the standard model. But the question then is, you know, if it only talks to gravity, a potential problem with that is, you know, how do you produce enough of it in the early universe to explain the fact that the universe today is full of dark matter? Where did the, where did the abundance of dark matter today come from? Um, and uh, so that's what, that's what this whole CPT story does a nice job of explaining. So, uh, so maybe I'll just say, so, you know, the idea is that, again, we're, 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 we're we're, we're, once we, we we were led to this hypothesis that the, that the universe really does not spontaneously violate CPT. So this this guy we imagine is in its CPT symmetric vacuum. But then the physical result of that is that uh, because the CPT symmetric vacuum disagrees with our late time vacuum, we, with our late time interpretation of physics using our late time number operators, we say that even though these guys are in their CPT symmetric vacuum, according to us, there is a non-zero abundance of them in the universe. It's as if they're being radiated from the early universe to us in the late universe with some abundance. And it's very analogous to, this is exactly the analogous calculation to the, to the Hawking radiation calculation for black holes. There, the, the black hole is really in one vacuum state, but a dis, distant observer, because it's a curved space-time, a distant observer defines a different vacuum state. So according to that distant observer, there's a non-zero flux of particles coming 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 uh, off the black hole. So it's very analogous, and uh, and you can just by calculating the relationship between the late time solutions, the solutions that look like positive frequency at late times, and the CPT symmetric solutions that satisfy that extra condition, you can work out exactly the abundance uh, of, of 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 those particles. And it turns out to just depend on the mass of these right-handed neutrinos. So this idea for the dark matter then leads, it gives a very elegant explanation for how the universe gets populated by this dark matter. Um, and it leads to th these following predictions. So prediction zero, I say here, because I don't, I don't know how to directly test it, is that the dark matter neutrino, this one stable neutrino, has to be 4.8 times 10 to the eight GeV to give the right dark matter abundance today. So in other words, in this approach, we interpret the measurement of the dark matter abundance today as just a measurement of one of the previously unmeasured parameters in the standard model, the, the mass of this particular neutrino. Um, uh, but prediction one, which is observable, is that it turns out that if that heavy neutrino 
So in this model, again, there's three heavy neutrinos, the right-handed neutrinos, roughly speaking, and then there's three light neutrinos, the left-handed neutrinos, roughly speaking, which are the ones we have detected. And the predi first prediction is that, which can be tested in the coming few years, is that if the heavy neutrino, if this heavy neutrino is exactly stable, it implies that one of the three lightest neutrinos is exactly massless. So, you know, at the moment, you may know that, that we've measured using neutrino oscillations, we've measured the differences between the masses of the three light neutrinos, but not their overall mass. So, but in this model, the, the lightest of those three is determined to have mass zero. And so that means that upcoming cosmology experiments like uh, uh, that measure the sum of the three light neutrino masses uh, should measure either 0 .6, 0 0.06 EV, the basically minimum possible mass in the case that the neutrinos are in the so-called normal hierarchy, or about twice that value if they're in the inverted hierarchy. And so here, this is just a figure showing the, you know, some uh, a, a while ago, a paper making some projections about how forthcoming experiments, including Euclid and Desi here, will, uh, uh, in combination with CMB experiments and, and possibly other experiments, how, how well they will do at uh, measuring the sum of the three neutrino masses. And the bottom line is that sometime within the next several years, it's expected that they will detect the sum of the three neutrino masses to be non-zero. And if they detect a value, which is not consistent with one of these two predictions, you know, then we would be ruled out. Um, Another prediction, another testable prediction, although it won't happen quite that fast, unfortunately, is the is that we also get a prediction for the neutrinoless double beta decay rate. Um, so that has not been that's an effect that hasn't been measured yet, but we predict that there's a non-zero value, which is basically the the the, the, the asymptotic value in this figure as you go to the left-hand side of the figure. Um, and again, there's two possible values depending on, again, whether the neutrinos are in the inverted or the normal hierarchy, which we don't know yet. Um, and then a, a second prediction is that, you know, as you, as, you, as, you, as you know, there's many different models of dark matter. Uh, if this model is right, the dark matter should be completely cold, uh, uh, non-relativistic, heavy particle dark matter. Uh, so any sign that it's warm dark matter or fuzzy dark matter or axions with very light masses or anything like that, that would rule out this model. Or there's also, of course, people doing very stringent tests, astrophysical tests of, of CDM in different ways. And again, if CDM doesn't continue to, if, if it ends up getting ruled out, uh, then you know this is ruled out. And then a third important prediction here is that we predict the same mechanism for producing the dark matter predicts that primordial gravitation waves should not be produced. Okay, basically because the, amount of the particle that's produced by this mechanism is proportional to its mass. And so, well, it's proportional to its mass to some positive power. And so uh, so since the graviton is massless, it doesn't get produced by the same argument. And so, you know, forthcoming experiments to detect, for example, B-mode polarization of the CMB, uh, we predict should not see it uh, if this model is correct. Or if they do see it, then, then this is ruled out. Okay, um, so let's see. So, so the next thing I wanted to tell you about was another another interesting few things about the universe that that, that seem to be explained by this picture can be understood by thinking about thinking more about um, quantum fields living on this two sheeted cylinder, this this two sheeted space time. Here, this is supposed to be the same cylinder that I showed before, but I've just taken the lower half and kind of folded it up inside the upper half like a glove, but it's it's supposed to be the same sort of picture. Um, and okay, so so again, the philosophy here is that we analytically extended the space time, noticed that it had a new symmetry, and then we wanted to take that symmetry seriously and think of it as a hint about nature and not as a mathematical artifact. And so in particular, I want the fields, I want to, I, I, uh, you know, I want the fields on the space-time to respect that symmetry. Um, and now if you look at the solutions on this space-time, you find that actually they're, they're all fields living on the space-time. Their solutions are all perfectly analytic, complex analytic functions down at the bang. And the combined requirement of, that they are symmetric with respect to the under, under swapping the, the inner and outer sheets and analytic at the bang ends up imposing that there's a 
mirror-like reflecting boundary condition on the fields down here at the bank. Okay, so we get a reflecting boundary condition on the fields. And that is good, actually. That turns out to rule out primordial vector perturbations. That, and, it, and for scalar perturbations, um, the fact that they satisfy an, an, a reflecting Neumann boundary condition down there, uh, well, it, yeah, it, the, the fact that they fact, it, sorry, I'm having trouble spitting this out, but this same argument forces the scalar perturbations zeta to satisfy a Neumann boundary condition down at the bang, which is exactly what we said earlier was the observed fact about the synchronization of the scalar perturbations uh, at early times. Now, you might ask, what about the future? What if we tried to analytically extend the space-time in the future? Uh, uh, would we get the same sort of argument there? And the answer is very interesting. The, the answer is no. That, um, and it, the, If you look at how the solutions of the wave equation behave up near the future boundary, they have an essential singularity up there. So there is no corresponding um, reflecting boundary condition at the future boundary. And so we think this gives a very elegant explanation for the thermodynamic arrow of time, the, the fact that the entropy of the matter in our universe has been growing as you go further, as you get further away from the Big Bang. It seems that this gives a nice explanation that just this sort of symmetry plus analyticity argument gives a nice explanation for that because it says the matter fields satisfied a very restricting boundary condition at early times, which pinned them in some very atypical place in their phase space but no corresponding, they're completely free uh, at, at the future boundary. And so they've just been, they started in this very restricted place in phase space and are just gonna wiggle into a more and more generic place as time goes along. Uh, and that's, that's why the entropy grows in that direction. Um, okay, so, so much for the matter entropy. Um, I wanted to, you know, so far I've been telling you about what happens when you analytically extend the solutions along the real time axis. Um, but uh, now let's think about what happens when you analytically extend them in the complex time plane. And the interesting thing is that you get a new formula for the gravitational entropy, uh, the, 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 the number of microstates underlying, gravitational microstates underlying a given macroscopic gravitational solution of Einstein's equations. Um, so this was a, yeah, this was a paper we put out in October uh, that, that got this formula and, and um, and, and then it has interesting consequences. So let me just try to briefly summarize what that's about. So, you know, step one here was that um, we just, the first thing is that is that if you just take the Friedman equation for a general realistic universe with all the matter components that we, all the sort of components we know should be there. So here's the Friedman equation, including a radiation density, some matter density, a cosmological constant. And then in principle, there could be some uh, spatial curvature there also. We're trying to explain why this is unobservably small. Um, so the first thing to say is that uh, this, uh, that, that we just wrote down the exact solution of this equation. Uh, it's, it, it turns out to have a rather beautiful and simple form in terms of these so-called uh, elliptic functions. These are these special analytic functions that are beautiful, functions on meromorphic functions on the complex plane. Now, the first thing to say is that I don't know. I mean, we, 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 we may, we, as far as we know, we're the first people to write down the solution, although maybe we just haven't found it and there's some earlier, some, someone did this earlier, but um, anyway, it sort of should have been written down earlier. It, it certainly could have been written down earlier. Um, but anyway, you know, for most practical purposes, uh, of course, when you're doing cosmology, you don't need the exact solution for the scale factor in terms of elliptic function. I mean, to a very good approximation in any region, it's well approximated by some simpler function. But the advantage here is that, again, because these these it happens to be that the solution always has this property that it's described by these elliptic functions, which are these special functions which are doubly periodic in the complex plane. So they they're both periodic when you look at oops. They're both periodic when you look at them along the real time axis, but also when you look at them around, along the imaginary time axis. And so it's as if they, they form a kind of tiling of the complex plane by, by the pattern. It's like there's a fundamental tile and then it just keeps repeating itself and, and, the, and the plane is tiled by that, by that pattern. Um, but another way to say that is, that is that really the solution, instead of living over the complex plane, you can just consider one of those tiles and the top of the tile is really glued to the bottom of the tile and the left of the tile is really glued to the right of the tile. 
And so it's really saying that this solution for the scale factor lives on the torus, that you, on the donut that you get by, by, by identifying the, the, the sides in that way. And the reason that's interesting is because then that makes it exactly analogous to, you see, there was this famous argument given in the 70s by Bekenstein and Hawking, which is how they calculated the entropy for black holes and for de Sitter space. They noticed in both of those cases that the solution, when you considered it as a function of the complex time, that it actually was periodic in the imaginary time direction. And so now we're saying, wait, actually, the, and, 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 but then, that, then that's crying out. It turns out there's a formal equivalence between quantum physics along the real time direction and statistical physics along the imaginary time direction so that there's, yeah, there's, this, there's this famous argument about how if you see a system that's, that's periodic in the imaginary time direction, you can reinterpret it. It's formally equivalent to a statistical system at some temperature. And in particular, you can calculate the entropy. They, they, they pointed out that you could calculate the entropy of those space times by just calculating their action around one period in the imaginary time direction. So we just do the exact same thing here. We now also see that, that the solution is periodic in the imaginary time direction. So we just calculate the action around one loop to get the entropy of that space time. And so we get, I mean, I won't write it down, but it's a rather simple formula for the gravitational entropy of a general FRW universe. And the striking thing that you notice when you do that is that if you ask where is that formula maximized, what, what universes have the highest entropy, it turns out to be spatially flat universes. In other words, universes where you know, the radiation domination decreases and then, and then it becomes matter dominated. And then that matter domination trans transitions immediately into lambda domination without any intervening period of um, spatial curvature being important. It, it was just always, all, it, we're, we're, the solutions that have the highest entropy are the ones like our own universe where the spatial uh, curvature is just negligible. Um, and also those with tiny positive cosmological constant, the, 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 the formula, the entropy goes up as lambda approaches zero from above, which I wish I could tell you that I had a explanation for why we observe the particular non-zero tiny value of the cosmological constant we do, but I don't have that. But, um, but this formula does say that that yeah, the, 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 the highest entropy is obtained by taking lambda to be as small as possible from above, which sounds not so dissimilar to our own universe, which has a positive but absurdly tiny cosmological constant. Um, and then now, so, so far that was talking about FRW universes. What if we try to add um, perturbations, small inhomogeneities and anisotropies? Um, well, when you add cosmological perturbations, you find that if the Big Bang is a mirror, so if those perturbations have to obey um, reflecting boundary conditions at the Big Bang, then you can show that they too always cost entropy. They lower the entropy. So the entropy favors universes that are homogeneous and isotropic over those that have small um, inhomogeneities or anisotropies. So we can't make a nonlinear argument about this. I wish we could, but at the level of, I mean, not yet anyway, but, but at the, what, we, what we've noticed so far is this thing about linear perturbations, that if the linear perturbations satisfy a mirror-like boundary condition like, like I had been trying to motivate earlier, um, then they too uh, are disfavored entropically. So it's, so in other words, to, in summary, the gravitational entropy strikingly turns out to be largest for universes a lot like ours that are homogeneous, isotropic, and flat, spatially flat, with a tiny positive cosmological constant. And so it seems to suggest that maybe this gravitational entropy is giving a new measure on the space of uh, universes and maybe a new explanation for why our universe is homogeneous, isotropic, and spatially flat, and maybe with a tiny positive cosmological constant, although that last part, again, I want to emphasize, it's not a great explanation yet because we don't observe zero, which is really what what would be favored by this by this strictly speaking is where the where this entropy formula is maximized okay yeah uh, is uh, the entropy formula still basically like uh, one over h squared but... one over h squared did you say yeah well it's 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 it, it it involves a power of one over the cosmological constant 
So it's proportional to one over the cosmological constant, but the but the pre but the co the, the but the factor that that's multiplied by is not always an order one number. So in particular, for very spatially flat universes, universes where the total volume of the universe is much 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 bigger than one horizon volume, one de Sitter horizon volume, the entropy is predicted to be much 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 bigger than the de Sitter volume, which is so so so. So, so the, the total entropy of the universe, according to this formula, is way bigger, can be way bigger, and is for our universe, for a very spatially flat universe, much bigger than the de Sitter entropy at that same value of the cosmological constant. Because... Well, exa ex exa exa exactly. That's, that's what I was saying. So it favors, it favors, it, it's, in it's in fact maximized for lambda being as small as possible. So, so ours is already small, but it would prefer it to be even smaller. So why it's not even smaller than what we see, we don't know the answer to that. It's just, it just seems like a step in the right direction that it favors a very small cosmological constant. Although I definitely agree with you that, it, that the fact that it favors, it seems to favor an even smaller cosmological constant than the one we see is a short shortcoming. Um, it, doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't seem to give a full explanation of that, yeah. Um, Okay, so um, okay, so 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 the, so this last part uh, will at first glance might seem different than the than the rest, um, but it's related to it's an it's another aspect of the story which is related to how we think a proposed our proposal for how the primordial density perturbations, the scale invariant spectrum of primordial perturbations, um, would be produced in this in this approach, um, and so let's start by thinking about um anomalies okay so 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 you know there's this you know famous fact about in physics that were symmetries are a key part of the story and they come in two flavors you know global symmetries uh where the symmetry parameter sort of doesn't depend on position in space time and then local or gauge symmetries where they do depend on on the local um where the symmetries uh do do yeah, the symmetry transformation can depend on, on, on the local space-time point. Um, so it is believed that, you know, we know that global symmetries, okay, so those, those normally we learn about symmetries as, as symmetries of the classical action, but then when you put that action into the path integral, when you quantize the theory, those symmetries, sym sym symmetries that look like symmetries for the classical action can fail to be symmetries at the quantum level, and those are called anomalies. Uh, and a global symmetry, it's fine if it has an anomaly. Indeed, we, we know of many examples in the real world of classical symmetries that are an, actually anomalous in nature at the quantum level. Um, but for gauge symmetries, it's believed that for consistency of the theory that their quantum anomalies have to vanish. And so here's a figure that I've stolen from the textbook by Peskin and Schroeder for, on quantum field theory, where he's where they are pointing out you know, the 10, 10 different anomalies that have to vanish for the standard model to be consistent. So each of these triangle diagrams is a kind of brief mnemonic of a whole bunch of Feynman diagrams that have to add up to zero. And there's 10 different calculations like this where a bunch of diagrams have to add up to zero. And in the standard model, they all do add up to zero and often in very non-trivial and uh, striking ways. Um, but that's what they had to do in order for the standard model to be a consistent theory. Okay, so there's one other local symmetry one might wonder about. What about local scale invariance, or in other words, vial invariance? So this is the freedom to locally rescale the metric by a constant factor uh, at, at, at different points in space time. So ever since the discovery of general relativity by Einstein, a lot of other people have emphasized that it seems weird that general covariance would be a symmetry of nature, but not local scale invariance, because somehow physically the argument is, you know, what is general covariance? Einstein's way of describing it was that it was local freedom to choose your reference frame. So, you know, our, we, if we choose a re certain reference frame to describe physics in here on earth, you know, it shouldn't affect the choice made by some alien in the, in the Andromeda galaxy. They can choose some different reference frame um, because it's just how we're describing the physics. It has really nothing, you know, the choice of how to describe the physics is not supposed to be somehow influencing the physics uh, 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 and a distant observer can make a different choice. 
Um, now, file symmetry is the same sort of thing, though. It's 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 the free you know it's it's the freedom to locally choose the scale the length scale with with which with respect to which I measure length. So it's like if I have three sticks of three different lengths sitting in front of me, and I pick up the middle one and I say, you know, behold, this is the meter and everything, you know, all, all, all distances are going to be measured relative to that. Again, if the, that should not force the hand of a alien in the, in the Andromeda galaxy, they should be able to independently choose which meter stick they want to use in Andromeda. And, you know, who cares? I mean, it should be, it should be a symmetry of nature because it's just about describing the physics. Um, and classically, it can be. So classically, you can take any theory and promote it to a locally scale invariant theory this way without changing its physical content. Um, but quantum mechanically, the story is different. Normally, quantum mechanically, there's an anomaly. Um, so here, so, I was, so, so first of all, many people have argued that it's a natural generalization of Einstein's general covariance or diff diffeomorphism invariance of general relativity. Um, and uh, there's other people that, all, that have also made other arguments. Uh, there, there's a, there's a, um, oh well. So 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 uh, never mind. Um, but so okay. So what about the standard model? So is the standard model classically vial invariant? Well, if you ignore for the the Higgs field for a moment, if you kind of ignore the terms in the standard model that involve the Higgs field, then actually yes, the standard model is classically vial invariant. But even then, if you quantize the the theory has an anomaly. The, the, that local scale invariance or vial invariance has an anomaly. And there's this famous formula that the trace of the stress energy tensor, which should be zero if the anomaly vanishes, uh, becomes non-zero on a curved background. So this is, it's equal to this, this coefficient C times the square of the vial curvature, and then minus another coefficient A times the so-called Gauss-Bonnet curvature. And these, these dimensionless coefficients C and A, they, they they have famous formulas that were found in the 1970s that just depend on, you see their dimensionless numbers and that, that just depend on the number of spin zero scalar fields in the theory, the number of spin one half fermion fields in the theory and the number of spin one gauge fields. But the key point is that you see the coefficients of all of these terms are all positive. So there can be no cancellation. So the number just seems to be non-zero in the standard model. And here for, for reference, I've also shown the, the vacuum energy contributed by those fields, because you know, for bosonic fields contribute positively to the H positive, you know, they contribute half H bar omega per degree of freedom to the to the vacuum energy, while fermions contribute negative half, half H bar omega per degree of freedom to the um, vacuum energy. Okay, so so it looks like in the standard model, the two the two contributions to the vial anomaly are just non-vanishing, too bad. And the vacuum energy is also famously non-vanishing. And so we have this famous cosmological constant problem. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, other book, what I discussed in that here is that this could be calculated in some sort of uh, chasm in a way for the... The, the, Sorry, this one down here? Yeah. So um, this is where I understand. This... He is so so here. This is just this is just the this is the leading order vacuum energy that you get if you just think of the this is if you just at the level of free field theory. Each Fourier mode is just an independent harmonic oscillator. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's what that's that the, the next the, on the next slide the miracle occurs. But that's exactly right. So this is this is exactly the formula that that, that each each Fourier mode contributes is like an independent harmonic oscillator that has a vacuum energy like one half h bar omega like the harmonic oscillator, and in the standard model it adds up to a non-zero thing proportional to omega for each mode, and then when you integrate that over d4k over d3k, I mean you get the omega to the fourth divergence, which is the lambda to the fourth usual story is that because this doesn't cancel in the standard model, you get the predicted huge vacuum energy, which, which diverges as the cutoff to the fourth power. So what the thing which we noticed uh, uh, last year um, was that, okay, so there is another way 
to couple a scalar field to gravity conformally in four dimensions. There's two ways to do it. Uh, so this is not, now this is not what we noticed. This is a famous thing noticed by Fredkin and Seitland back when they were studying conformal supergravity in the early 80s. Um, but so the, so, you know, there's, there's the, there's the, there's the usual Klein-Gordon scalar field, and there's a way to couple it to gravity, which is conformally invariant. And, uh, but then there's this, there, there's, there's a second, there's only one other way to do it. And that's using this kinetic term um, involving a different operator, del four here, which was discovered by these guys. Um, and, you know, they also calculated what is the contribution to the vacuum energy and to the vial anomaly by these weird scalar fields. So these are, the, this is, so now here N zero prime is the number of these new weirdos. And the interesting thing that, I mean, the thing which we noticed was, we, so, you know, I, before I realized Fredkin and Seitlin had done this, I was calculating these things myself and I, I got this first, uh, you know, number. And um, uh, I asked, you know, okay, well, it has a minus sign, that's exciting. Could I choose some number of scalar fields here that could cancel uh, this to zero? And the answer in the standard model, if you take the sort of standard model values for N zero, N one half and N, N one, the answer is no, you know, because you see they all have these weird coefficients. Um, but then I realized, oh wait, but but if this if the Higgs field is not a fundamental field, if it's some sort of composite or emergent field, so n zero was actually zero, uh, then actually if I choose n zero prime to be thirty six, uh, then this would cancel to zero, and then I was surprised to find, oh wait, that same thirty six would also call ca cause the C to cancel, and that same thirty six would also cause the vacuum energy to cancel. So there's this bit of numerology, bit of bit of striking numerology that 36 of these new uh, uh, conformally coupled scalar fields cause both vial anomalies and the vacuum energy to cancel, um, and that only works. That that that, that it's, it's it's another way to say how that's surprising is that it wouldn't be possible for a general theory that to even find a cancel a thing that it wouldn't be possible to find any number of fields that would cancel all three of these anomalies. It only works because you need a theory where the number of fermion, you, you see, here's the general solution. You, you, to, get this, to get these three things to all cancel, you need the number of gauge fields to be one fourth of the number of fermion fields, which happens to be true in the standard model. The number of gauge fields in SU3 times SU2 times U1 is 12, if you add up the dimensions of those groups. Uh, and uh, the number of fermion fields, if you include right-handed neutrinos, well, it's 16 per generation, and then there's three generations. So it turns out to be 48, which is exactly four times this, exactly what the doctor ordered. Um, and so in a sense, you might say this only works because the standard model has three generations, which is a fact about the standard model, which is famously hard to, doesn't have good explanations. So it's intriguing. Um, now, how were we thinking about these fields in the first place? Well, we were thinking about them because unlike an ordinary Klein-Gordon scalar field like the normal inflaton, the normal inflaton has a spectrum in flat space which is too blue. It doesn't match the scale invariant spectrum we see in the early universe. So before it can give the scale invariant spectrum you need, you need to put it in an inflating background. And that stretches, that, that, that boosts the red part of the spectrum and makes it scale invariant. But these fields, because they have a different kinetic term, they have a different propagator, they have a different two-point function. Their two-point function is automatically scale invariant already in flat space, and it's scale invariant in any FRW universe. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just it's it, th 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 that's why we were interested in them. And an, and another important thing to say is that you know 36 new degrees of 30, 36 new scalar fields sounds like a big price to pay, like a lot of extra stuff you had to add to the theory in order to get what what we wanted. But a striking thing about these fields is that they do not have, when you quantize them, they actually don't have, they're almost trivial. They don't have any local degrees of freedom. They don't, uh, they don't, they, they, they just have a vacuum state. The only non-trivial state is the vacuum state. And so it's as it, again, these are, these are these two, two different, I've pointed to two different references here that, 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 that obtain that result in two very different ways. But um, so the so striking thing is that it's like they are just some accounting 
they're just, they're not really new physical fields in a sense. They're like changing the definition of the vacuum of the standard model to make it more consistent with gravity, to cancel the vial anomalies, to cancel the vacuum energy, and to give the right uh, scale invariant spectrum of uh, vacuum correlations, which we seem to observe in the early universe, or that is our, that is what we think seems exciting about these guys. Um, and in fact, we're just, fin we're finishing a paper, Neil and I are finishing a paper, we've been working for a long time to calculate the exact, so this is the, this is the two point correlator of the scalar fields, famously, there's another step where you calculate the corresponding induced two point correlator of the curvature perturbation, which is the thing you actually observe in the CMB. So we've been cal that calculating, working on that for a long time. And Neil just made very remarkable progress on this and got an explicit formula for this. Um, and, you know, so it's a bit of a technical story, which I didn't write down here, but basically if you make the most naive assumptions in his, so you know, there's these 36 scalar fields, a priori, we don't know a reason why the 36 fields all have to couple identically to the standard model. However, if you assume they do all couple identically to the standard model, then Neil's formula gives a prediction for the amplitude of the primordial scalar curvature power spectrum in terms of the standard model parameters. And it is quite close to the observed, I mean, it's, it, it differs, it's 30% below the observed primordial amplitude, which I emphasize, it disagrees with the primordial amplitude to within error bars, but it is to our knowledge, the first, you know, first principles rigid calculation of the primordial amplitude in terms of the parameters of the standard model. We don't have to add potentials with free parameters that we tune to get the right answer. But I should say that if you then relax the assumption that all 36 fields couple in the same way, which again, we don't a priori know why that has to be true, and you ask, oh, how much do the couplings have to vary? It turns out that if the sort of RMS value of those couplings is roughly 25%, then, then that would be that would change the answer to, to match. That's what you would need to change the answer to match the uh, observed scalar amplitude of the primordial perturbations. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm, I see I'm close to the end of time. So here's my summary. Um, so I've tried to tell you about a, a picture that we're excited about where we really take seriously the analytic extensions of the cosmological solutions of the Einstein equations and the standard model. And we are led, when we analytically extend along the real time direction, we are led to a picture where the Big Bang is a kind of mirror. And when we analytically extend along the imaginary time direction, we're led to a new formula for the gravitational entropy. And I tried to explain that these ideas give new explanations for what the dark matter is and why it's, uh, yeah, what were predictions about explanations for the dark matter, for the thermodynamic arrow of time in the matter sector, for the absence of primordial tensor perturbations or gravitational waves, the absence of primordial vector perturbations or vorticity, uh, for the Neumann initial conditions for scalar density perturbations, the fact that they're synchronized at early times, and for the homogeneity, isotropy, and flatness of the universe, and for the smallness of the positive of, of the cosmological constant modulo the things which uh, Dick pointed out earlier. Um, and then finally, we saw how without introducing new local degrees of freedom, 36 of these weird dimension zero scalar fields can uh, cancel both the vial anomalies, both of the vial anomalies and the vacuum energy seem to give a kind of explanation in quotes of the existence of three generations, which we saw was needed to have the right relationship between fermions and gauge bosons to get that cancellation, and uh, seem to be able to give a scale invariant power spectrum of density perturbations um, without having to put the theory in an inflating background. So those that's all the good news. Actually, there's a lot left to, left, still left to be um, understood, and uh, yeah, a lot, lot that still, still we don't understand about this. But anyway, that's, that's, that's the summary of what we're uh, yeah, excited about. Thanks for listening. Questions in the room or online? Uh, this is for Zoom. You have a formula for the total gravitational entropy. Do you have a formula for the entropy density? Uh, 
Yes, we could derive a formula for the entropy density. I, 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 I see, so you mean, uh, but it's not a constant with with time. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. So it, it it would scale as one over a cubed, but uh, it would blow up at tau equals zero. It would blow up at tau equals zero. At what equals zero? It would blow up, like you said, one over a something. Oh yes, uh, no, it blows up as one. Oh well, yeah, the density would, yeah. So so we 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 get we get some sort of constant characterizing the four geometry as a whole. So um, in terms of density, you could you could then divide that by the volume of the spatial the spatial volume of the universe at any moment and get the entropy density. Um, uh, and it would blow up as the dense, as the volume goes to zero near the Big Bang. Yeah. Um, what, 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 maybe maybe say more what you have in mind there. Maybe one thing to say, which is I don't know if this is relevant to what you're thinking about, is that um, the number you get for the entropy is for the entropy density is huge compared to the matter entropy density. It's, it's, it, it, it's, so it's so it's so the the matter entropy density is almost negligible by comparison. Is that is that maybe related to what you're thinking about or? Um, the matter density has a more natural local interpretation, I think. Is there an effect of temperature associated with the entropy? Yeah, N not, uh, it, it's it's basically the de Sitter temperature. So it, locally, again, it would be something that would be blowing up um, at zero time, would it? Uh, I, Yes, I, I mean, in other words, if you just did that naive thing and divided it by the volume, yeah. I don't know about whether I don't know to what extent it makes sense to think about it. You know, because we I'll, let me say it a different way. Um, you know, the way that we got this formula was by this sort of slick Gibbons Hawking trick, which is in a way very unphysical. I mean, it's just that we found the exact solution and then we were sort of surprised to see that it was always periodic in the imaginary time direction and sort of crying out to have, have its entropy calculated in that way. And so we calculate it, but uh, we would love to have some more um, physical way of, of calculating and interpreting the same answer, um, which isn't such a kind of uh, mathematical sleight of hand or something like that. And, um, you know, uh, so the best, you know, a couple things that I've noticed, I mean, I, so I've just been kind of, I, I don't have a kind of first principles way to do that, but I, I have a couple arguments that get the same answer by different paths. And one of them is that, I mean, it, it may be relevant to this to this question is that, uh, you know, so ha uh, Beckenstein had this famous for way that he calculated the entropy of a black hole originally by saying, you know, oh, if, if, if it was really, if a black hole is kind of made of gravitons, each of which has a wavelength, which is roughly the Schwarzschild radius, how many gravitons, of, how many of those gravitons would it take to make the mass of the black hole? And it turns out to be m squared worth of gravitons. And so it matches the uh, entropy you want. And so here, a similar thing is true that if you say that the universe is made of gravitons, each of which is the size, is the length of the de Sitter horizon, and you ask how many of those gravitons, and so each of those has a has an energy contributes an energy one over the radius of the de Sitter h bar times one over the radius of the de Sitter uh, horizon. How how many of those would you need to build up the total energy of the universe at the start of the lambda domination? Uh, that's a way to get our that's a way to get our formula. So it it's, it suggests a picture where this entropy is being is because the universe is constructed. Maybe it suggests that the ent this ent entropy value is coming because the universe is constructed from gravitons, which are given by the the Sitter horizon wavelength. But um, again, that's just kind of post post hoc way of trying to trying to understand what the formula means. But um, uh, the other thing blowing up in your picture, though, are the curvature and variance. Which curvature and variance do you mean? Um, the, 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 because at the curvature invariance. So at the bang, actually, that's a good point. Um, so so at the Big Bang, you know, the the uh, uh, none of the vial invariant curvature invariance blow up. If 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 the perturbations, you see, part one of the things that these. So if you just had an unperturbed Big Bang, then the Ricci scalar would blow up at the 
no, actually the Ricci scalar wouldn't blow up, but the, but the other scalar curvature invariants in general would blow up. But the vial invariant ones, like the vial tensor squared or anything, anything that's vial invariant does not blow up at the Big Bang. Now, once you include perturbations, well, you know, typically perturbations would blow up and you'd have a very complicated Big Bang and, uh, you know, kind of BKL chaotic singularity. And there, the curvature invariants, including the violent variant ones, normally would blow up. But it turns out reflecting boundary conditions at the bang kill those. They give you, instead, you get the modes, you, you instead, they select the modes like the ones we see that seem to obey, a, 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 instead of blowing up, hit a, hit a Neumann boundary condition at the Big Bang. And in that case, again, all the violent variant curvature perturbations, all the violent variant curvature invariants remain small. They're not zero anymore, but, they're, but they stay small at the Big Bang. So it's a, the hypothesis is that, again, that this vial symmetry is really a key, this special property of the Big Bang that Penrose emphasizes that it seems to, seems to be only a singularity if you don't have local vial symmetry. We're, we're kind of imagining, it seems, it seems that, that you know, this whole picture it's, it's, makes more sense if you do have local vial symmetry and it's just spontaneously broken in the world around us. Um, you say some curvature invariants do blow up. Um, vial non-invariant ones do. And so doesn't that indicate you're pushing Einstein's theory beyond where it should be? That's a good question. I mean, so, so you know, so it, it is indeed a kind of, um, you know, I don't, we're going to get into sort of crazy, my crazy speculations here more than what, what the, 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 but, but it is a very good question. Why, if the theory is vial invariant, why is the corresponding theory of gravity that it's coupled to uh, not vial invariant? Because Einstein gravity is, is not, is not vial invariant. Um, uh, although you can again promote it by the sort of Stuckelberg mechanism to a vial invariant equivalent theory, but then when you, how should that be? Does that is that promotion still valid at the quantum level? I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, but you know, I think that um, maybe what's going on is that is that you know really at the bang at the surface of the bang is where vial invariance is unbroken, and and then as soon as the universe obtains a finite size and a finite temperature and as soon as finite scales enter the game, that that is what spontaneously breaks the vial symmetry to a to a to a, a broken phase where maybe Einstein gravity applies. Um, but uh, an exact uh, exactly how to describe that um, quantitatively, I don't know. But the one thing to say is that is that is that if you ask you know which of the various predictions we did relies on believing the Einstein equations actually at the Big Bang. You know, you don't need to do that actually, because you know, again, if you if you were going to plow through the Big Bang by sticking along the real time axis, then you'd have to go through the curvature singularity. But if you really take seriously the fact that it's that it's described by this analytic function in the complex plane, then the Big Bang is a, a zero at one point in the in 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 the uh, 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 in the scale factor in the complex tau plane, and and that's a place where all these curvature invariants have a pole. Um, but you just, just like in other complex analysis problems or like in tunneling through a barrier, you can, you can alternatively just follow a path around the pole that takes a wide berth around it where the curvature never gets big. And so I think that for these sort of extension arguments, I don't think we need to ask, ask about, ask about the, the, the physics very near the bang. Now, if you ask, could we then would we be able to ask answer questions about exactly how this model is behaving very near the bang within a Planck time of the bang? Or, or I bet we wouldn't be able to tell you. You know, I think we probably, probably maybe Einstein's equations wouldn't be the right equations to use there. But for these various for the dark matter calculation, for example, all the action there takes place when the temperature is down around the mass of the dark matter particle. For example, long after you've gotten away from the Planck scale, and so. Yeah, so it's a good point that I don't think I don't think we should really trust. Probably we should not trust Einstein's equations too close to the Big Bang. That's 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 almost certainly true. Um, but you can nevertheless calculate a bunch of these things without having to go into that regime. Okay. I think we had a question online. Yeah. 
Would the massive right-handed would these be massive right-handed neutrinos? Yes, exactly. They would, yes. So, so the idea is that these are the these are the three the three right-handed neutrinos in the standard model. They they have Majorana masses that can, in principle, be way above the and usually are assumed in the seesaw mechanism to be way above the electroweak scale. And so, two of those massive right-handed neutrinos, when they decay, they can create the matter-antimatter asymmetry by leptogenesis. And then the third one is we're saying is stable. The third massive right-handed neutrino is stable. Really, it's not right-handed. Really, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's the it's the it's the what's normally referred to as the right-handed neutrino, but really the mass state is a Majorana mass. Um, but uh, yeah, that 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 may or may not be helpful depending on whether you, what, what 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 your background in neutrino physics is. But um, so they're, they're, they're all the all six mass states for the neutrinos, the three light states and the three heavy states are all Majorana masses, but the light Majorana mass eigenstates are made almost exclusively of what are called the left-handed, left chiral fermions in the standard model, the ones that do talk to the weak gauge force, whereas these heavy neutrinos are almost exclusively made of the right-handed neutrino, right chiral neutrinos, meaning the ones that do not talk to any of the gauge forces. <coughs> Would these be detectable by any chance? Would they be detectable by what? Say that one more time. Yeah, would these be detectable, you think? Uh, well, they could be if they're completely stable, then if they're exactly stable. So there's a, there's a symmetry that in the standard model can make the heavy neutrino exactly stable. Uh, and if it is exactly stable, then it turns out to be exactly decoupled from everything except gravity. The same symmetry cuts it, from, cuts it off from everything except gravity. Uh, so if that's true, it would be very hard to detect it except gravitationally, but there are these indirect things you can do to test that this is what's really going on. Again, there's a prediction for the observable prediction for the sum of the three light neutrino masses and for the neutrino-less double beta decay rate that you can directly test to see. And if, if those predictions are wrong, then this stable neutrino idea is also wrong. Thank you. Sure. We are past so I suggest we continue the discussion upstairs with cookies and coffee. Uh, and let's thank those people again. Okay, thank you again. <laughs>